Hello and welcome to this new episode of the Great Legal Mind Show. Today I have with me a senior advocate, Ms. Geeta Lutra. She wears so many hats and she has done so many different things in her life uh, that the conversation is going to be really interesting. And uh, so we'll be exploring different aspects of that uh, as we move along. Uh, so, you know, please welcome Ms. Lutra. Um, thank you so much, ma'am, for being here today. It's my pleasure. Now, in fact, uh, you know, uh, when actually, you know, somebody reads about you, you know, there's so many facets that, you know, one gets to see. So, you know, I would want to know from you that, you know, what all, you know, kind of matters you 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 look at actually you know i i i know of criminal i know of matrimonial but there's so many of those you know from the corporate side as well that you do so you know can just begin with you know what all you actually do in in a day's time so um i think uh, the day has come when specialization is the key word uh, and pursuing or doing various fields is not what is canonical. I remember when in the medical profession, we used to see specialists, oh, so-and-so is a pediatric surgeon, so so-and-so is a heart specialist so, and a cardiac, children cardiac specialist, pediatric cardiac specialist, we used to wonder, I said, you know, in the law, everybody is a jack of all trades. And that's how it was when we started the profession. Things have moved on so, so differently. And this profession is one profession which has been so dynamic in the last four or five decades where specialization has become a key word. So you may be an IPR specialist, you may be a cyber law specialist, you may be a criminal law specialist, where you are doing human aspects of criminal law, the bodily crimes, or you may be doing only commercial 420 cheating, forgery cases. There are people who say we are a builder, criminal law specialist. So there are these various hats. I unfortunately haven't moved with the times. So I've remained static where I was several years ago. And therefore I'm doing a lot of fields, a smattering of all fields. And it's so interesting and so engaging because all the time, even as a lawyer, you are thinking, your mind is growing, you are developing new skills. I, um, I am currently vice president of Indian Council of Arbitration. I'm on the committee of the ICC for India. And so that's my arbitration hat. I do criminal law. I'm in the women's white collar crime group, India chapter, which is an international body. And it's uh, uh, very well respected throughout the world. Uh, in matrimonial law, I am a member of the internet, the associate academy of family lawyers. And therefore, and this is the International Academy of Family Lawyers. Um, and so on in various fields, been active in law Asia, and I've spoken on various subjects, including environment law, which I have done several cases in Supreme Court. So it's, it's a very okay. dynamic practice and law is extremely dynamic, extremely engaging and extremely interesting. Absolutely. That's a long list. And I think uh, that, you know, that actually explains your 16 hours a day routine. 
<laughs> now you know i'll i'll actually i'll have a you know some i'll have some questions related to you know gender specific uh, you know matters that you would have handled but before that i wanted to actually ask you i mean it's a, it's a very interesting question that you know you know as 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 a like you know as woman um you know when you handle criminal matters i mean uh, you know how the journey has been i mean right from the beginning till today because you know there are all kinds of people that you would be dealing with and you know just tell us you know you know maybe one or two you know very very interesting or challenging matters that you would have handled uh, in in your career so um early on in life my father the late uh, k k lutra was um, a leading criminal lawyer of india and um, i had helped him in the saint kitts matter uh where one of the late prime ministers of india was involved and accused and the chairman of the customs board uh who was not then the chairman but became the chairman so these the, the matters such matters they will have a smattering of criminal law or prevention of corruption act of kickbacks question is there a kickback is there a contract which is unconscionable various aspects come in the important aspect of course on which the matter was won was on a sanction matter that for criminal law accused sanction for government officers is mandatory and which was not taken in that case but to evolve and to work on it to find what could be the legal or the technical infirmity in the case is something which is very engaging i was uh, appearing for one of the main accused in the harshad mehta scam many many years ago and recently uh, the there are several cases which are mostly sub judices so one can't really speak about them and their cases in india go on and on um so uh people have questioned me with regard to say the tarun tej pal matter or other matters where criminal defamation may be involved some of which involve lead, leading personalities and these are aspects which one is queried about is it something which you agree with should you as a lawyer feel that you have a moral duty where you agree with what you are defending or can you be legalistic about it what what is the ethos which makes you interested in criminal law including you know augusta westland where for on a aspect of pmla i had got one of the then main accused bailed out from the delhi high court so these are various interesting aspects i think what for me is important about criminal law is what is important for all of human rights the right of liberty of an individual the right and very recently justice call had talked about it in that satinder antel case that perhaps we should have a special enactment for bills now i don't feel we need an enactment we need a ethos which recognizes that bills should be the rule and generically speaking now it's very difficult and very not palatable for those who may be the complainant and that's why the original ethos was that the complainant has no role to play the complainant had no role to play because 
it was between the state which wanted law and order to be its subject and ensure law and order and the accused. But over a period of time, this has been watered down because it felt that the state may actually compromise on the right of the complainant for right or wrong reasons. It may just not feel as passionately about the matter. It may have other extraneous reasons where it may not prosecute as, uh, as strongly as may be required. And then the role of the complainant over the last 10 years has increased or 10 or more years, it has increased. But the ethos is this, you need law and order for the individual, but you also need liberty for an accused. Question is, do you need anonymity for a complainant, say in a rape case, but you also need anonymity for an accused. What after five years you are quitted? say a rape accused, say a murder accused. So this recently, this aspect of the right to be forgotten. Yeah. Now all of it, all of criminal law emanates from some fundamental rights and some rights enshrined in the constitution of India. And therefore, to a large extent, Criminal law may be procedural in so far it pertains to various enactments, but at the bottom of it, it is a matter of human liberty and law and order. And as Lord Denning said, the balance that you need to draw between the two so that the law and order doesn't become subservient to liberty, but the liberty of an individual needs to be protected unless he is convicted and that conviction is upheld in an appeal court. How do you return the respect, the name, the dignity of either a complainant or an accused? Now we've tried to take care of complainant by trying to give anonymity. The question that is being asked in today's day is, do you think the accused should also have anonymity? And that's not a question which has been addressed by many courts in India. But uh, I know I'm giving a generic answer rather than about my cases, but- uh, No, that's fine. But I think because this is a very important conversation. And in fact, you know, we very often see that, uh, you know, people who are, um, who have complained one who are you know uh, who are accused but you know uh, who should actually get the anonymity there's no reason why they should be publicized but they are publicized a lot and i think therefore this is a very important conversation that you are like you know where you are talking about I and mean, very recently we saw that happening in noida i mean you know there was no reason for that person to be you know, photographed and, you know, and today, you know, you media actually, you know, publishes those things in a click of a second. And then I think, uh, you know, it, it becomes a huge dent for the rest of your life, actually. And no kind of apology makes up. No kind Absolutely. of connotation makes up for that. We have to remember this. I mean, there were... Uh, uh, in the last 10 years when Me Too has come up, there yeah. were actors and so others who got accused and later uh, it was explained away or uh, dropped or apologies yeah. given or whatever. But the person, that mark on that person remains. So the no, question- Absolutely, ma'am, yeah. The question then is, how do you protect those people? And now very recently, the Supreme Court has talked <clears throat> about in line with 
with international thinking, one, the right to be forgotten, which goes much beyond this, which means even if a person is accused, even if there is a judgment, civil or criminal against them, would they have a right of anonymity? Now, the courts, for example, in some cases, have said, give anonymity. Um, but it is still not complete anonymity, and we still have to evolve to that circumstance. In the case before the Supreme Court, it was the person who had the litigation who was, in a sense, the petitioner or the complaining party who said, for my posterity, I want a quietus to it. But what if an accused comes and says, all right, I was convicted. I've done my turn. Yeah. The law envisages under criminology that I have a right to, I have a right to a new life. My life becomes a new slate. I've got remission after serving for 10, 14 years or whatever. Should there be this question, this person did not, why have you remitted? Why is there been remission in his case or reprieve in his case? So of course, there will be glaring cases. There will be glaring cases where you need the fourth pillar to speak up. Right. I cannot say if they are not vigilant, a lot of things would be brushed under the carpet. Right. But we cannot yet start browbeating people yeah. when they may be totally innocent and then make it into a media trial, which then gives them however independent a judge is. It will play on his mind. Right. And now with social media there, we have to be very cautious. And so this is, of course, diverting to a, some extent from the subject. But what I'm saying is, how do you insulate a court of law from social media and sometimes the backlash of a social media so that he can do his duty dispassionately. And even if the person is wrong, assume a judge is wrong, can we do judge bashing? He may be right or wrong. You have a right of appeal. But can we do that bashing? Because then you are preventing that person from making a legal dispassionate decision based on his file. No, absolutely. I think, you know, that's a fantastic point. In fact, you know, in fact, the, the thing that you've talked about, uh, you know, Me Too cases where I think, you know, there were a lot of people who were, you know, who were subjected to trials, but there was nothing really against them. Uh, you know, I actually wanted to actually, you know, have, you know, ask you a question around that. But I think before that, I wanted to check with you that there is a, there, there are a lot of conversations about, you know, around, uh, you know, gender based crimes. And I think uh, based on that, I think we've prepared a very robust uh, legal framework, which, you know, favor women quite a bit. Um, we, we created a lot of laws that support women. Do you think that legal framework is good enough? Because, you know, I think, you know, it's a, it's a very delicate balance. I mean, there, you know, there, there's always two sides of the stories. So let me just ask you first from the point of view of women that, you know, do you think the laws that exist today are good enough to kind of, you know, uh, support women? So what good is a law if it does not deliver? If it takes five years to deliver, and in the meantime, it may name and shame somebody rightly or wrongly, but it's not delivering. 
So if you are going to get justice after five or seven years, by which time your rights are gone. I remember very sadly this case where a lady came to me from one of the um, more upmarket uh, uh, colonies of Delhi. And she had an autistic child. And she said, when will you be able to get maintenance? I don't have parents and I'm married to this person who is extremely financially uh, well off. But when will you get me maintenance? I need it yesterday, not tomorrow. And honestly, if we have to be honest with them, we have to tell them that perhaps it will take one and a half years for you to get even a penny. Can those people wait for that one and a half years? And I have done, and I'm not, um, I'm talking about my earlier days when I used to do a lot of legal aid work for the Legal Aid Services Authority of India. And I had been roped in so that I used to be there every day doing something or the other for them, uh, either in the high court or the trial courts or the even going to Supreme Court and so on. And um, in those days, we used to see that there were those underdogs who actually had absolutely no clue of where they will go. Now, what use is law to them? If what they are going to get is after five or seven years when they will be destitute and sitting in some ashram where they may be having molestation happening to them. So they are going from the devil to the deep sea. Yeah. So the question that you ask, that are the laws enough? Of course the laws are good. Which country do you have a 498? In fact, one of the issues the law commission has recommended that there is abuse of 498 uh, IPC and that it should be made available. The, of course, after Nesh Kumar, that's become watered down because in any case, the court has said that for seven years and below seven years, you need to follow Section 41A and not arrest just like this. But the issue is, are the laws good enough? I believe the laws are good enough. You have a GV Act, which although highly imperfect, the courts have read out very well. You have 498, you have dowry death and 304 B added. No country in the world has these as penal offenses because they are impossible to prove. And the standard of proof in a criminal case should be very high. So the, I think what is required is that you need people to give more respect to disputes which arise interpersonal. It may be custody battles, it may be matrimonial matters, but honestly speaking, they are put on a back burn. If you are not going to get your first hearing for six months, then it's no good. If you are first put yeah. The implementation no, is the key. Hmm. The, the importance is not the law. The law is in place. The importance is the remedy and the hearing and the importance to be given to matters which 
may appear insignificant. Some of these, this child custody matter, it may appear insignificant, but it is equally a matter of human rights. Uh, Absolutely. Maintenance matter means, he, oh, it's only maintenance. But for but that he, person, it's important. Equally yeah. important for the man. So I feel the laws are in place. No country in the world has so many... Such extensive and, framework. Mm -hmm. But ma'am, just one question is that, so what could be the reason? Is it because of, you know, the courts are overburdened or is it because, you know, they are not like, you know, considered important? You know, what exactly is the reason for this kind of delay? So just take one thing. Uh, take a maintenance case. I mean, I'm, it may not sound significant, but take a maintenance case. You can go under HAMA, you can go under 125, you can go under DV Act, you can go under personal law like the Hindu Marriage Act and file under 24. Why should there be, and every time a person's not getting relief, they think, let me file one more case. But you're already burdening or overburdened system. Shouldn't the system give Sukur within two, three months so that that person is, is restrained mentally from filing five other cases? So there is an overlap. The courts permit the overlap because of the delays and because of various reasons and language of the enactment, but the system is overburdened in every which way. So if a bail notice of a person who is an accused, who is sitting in custody, stay in Tihar or Mundoli or any other jail, if his notice is given one and a half months later, and he has to remain in for one and a half months, despite what all the directions of all the courts may be, including in suomoto matters by the courts themselves. Then what good is it? I remember one of the courts telling that how, when I have granted bail today, why was the person not released today itself? Every minute is important for an accused. But ultimately, the, this kind of alacrity can come with, of course, a sensitive mindset, but also with the time to the court to apply that alacrity. If you are overburdened with say 100 cases, how much alacrity can you show? You should Absolutely. Absolutely. So I are, think that's... Mm -hmm. There are issues. But yeah. if your question is, are there sufficient laws my answer to that is, I believe that the laws are more than sufficient, more stringent. Even the criminal laws, whether it's rape, whether it's 304B, much more stringent than in any part of the common law world where our criminal jurisprudence is based on the penal code, on the principle that liberty of an individual is important and uh, that the standard of proof has to be very, very strong for any conviction. Okay, let me ask you now another question which is different from you know this line of question is that um, i think uh, you know um, the, the the area you chose uh, 
you know, is otherwise totally a man's bastion. And in fact, you know, when, you know, I'm doing my series of, you know, talking to lawyers, you know, I always, you know, try to find women lawyers who I can actually, you know, get on my show and interview. And it's difficult to find. And my team actually always tells me that, you know, look, you know, you have to do it. So, but, you know, it's difficult to find women. So, I mean, I just wanted to ask you, this is the situation today. So, you know, when back then you joined the, 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 you know, court practice and all of that, how, you know, difficult or easy it was for you at that point of time? So, if I look back, it must have been a difficult journey. But I was such a fighter that uh, for me, it was just the passion of the law. And I think I, uh, as a child, um, and my father was very keen, I joined the administrative services. So I even thought I'll give the exam, uh, clear it and show him that I can do it and get back to law patient in my own way. But it so happened that after the prelims, I got admission to Cambridge. So I, uh, I dodged that one. But I would do little cutouts when I was seven years old because my father who was a criminal law lawyer. His name would be in the paper or his cases almost every other day in the evening news. And I would do these cutouts and do a scrapbook, which of course, I don't know what happened to it and where it went, except that it served this purpose that I wanted to be passionately a lawyer. My father was equally passionate that I will not be a lawyer <laughs> because he knew that this profession was not for women at that time. And my mother, of course, was completely supportive what I wanted to do. She said, if it's law, then it can, has to be law. But there were no successful women lawyers. And it was others. And I must say that even though the courts have were kind to us, there was and has been a mental, mental block for making women judges, for appointing women as judges. And at that time, if I recall, Justice Leela Seth had come, Justice Sunanda Bhandare had come, and various reasons. But if you look at somebody on merit, being appointed a judge or being made a designate senior, that did not happen. That did not happen. And if you are a lone voice, you are not the kind who's going to keep saying instead of doing your work and proving yourself, which in any case is itself for others or even doing what you are passionate about, helping people, helping those accused, those criminals who are in jail, helping them out. You are not concentrating on saying, no, give a percentage to women, remember gender issues, do this. You're just doing your work and you're not thinking. Because if you're going to have a chip on your shoulder, then that chip is not going to leave you very satisfied or happy or is not allowing you to pursue your passion with the integrity and with the determination and grit that you want. Absolutely. Now, uh, you know, you are a family of lawyers, okay? So what's your usually uh, dinner table discussion that, that really happens? And uh, let me ask you another question that, you know, what if, like, you know, some of you were lawyers and some of you were not lawyers. Do, do you think that the con conversation could have been more interesting or less interesting uh, on your dinner table? So the, uh, the conversation on our dinner table 
while I was a child was a lot on politics, on uh, on what's going around around us in India or abroad. That was the conversation. My mother had been a professor in Lady Irvin College. She had been academic and had given up her career for the children. My father was a lawyer. Slowly over the years, some aspect of law may creep up in, or it sort of makes its way into the conversation, even if you're sort of trying to say, make sure. So we have two surgeons in the family and so on. So we, they, they are overpowered by us. So they said, if you can't beat them, join them. So they also get into some aspect of the, but the essential conversation used to be about human rights and about protecting human rights. And my father used to fight for the cause of uh, everybody who was out of power and a lot of leaders and you name it. And he was doing their matters. And so it used to be about protection of human rights, how to end about politics in general without anyone being in any political party or uh, having a particular following. One of my father's uh, colleagues who influenced me was in the Socialist Party and um, he was with dad for about 40 years. So that discussion with him used to be and with lots of leaders, we used to our dining room conversations, father was very social, so we would always, home was full of visitors. Now with me being a working woman, it can't be full of visitors because you need someone to hold the backup so that you can serve the food if you are having so many visitors or be sociable. And if you're not working, you have to call it a day. But the conversation's been interesting. Um, my father was very literary, was very fond of Persian poetry. So we would have that Urdu and that music. Both parents were very musical. The children are tone deaf probably. But <laughs> we had had all that in our lives. And um, the, um, the discussion was a lot around sports in its own way. They were both sports people, both my parents. So, so were them, you. So were you. <laughs> well, and you still so are to I. some extent, yeah? <laughs> so was I. And... Uh, uh, we, I and my sister both played hockey for Delhi several years. So, so was I. Uh, and that's your parental value system Influence, which gets yeah. the brain. So my father would leave the courts and come to the national stadium to see us play. And that, I think, is somewhere some of us fail when we become such heavy-duty professionals. But uh, I'm fortunate that my daughter's uh, extremely fond of health and fitness. And so, but it's not because of me, it's despite me. That's all I can say. But yes, sports has been something which I think it is very important for an overall development of personality. And I think it makes you learn to win. It makes you learn to lose. It makes you learn to be fair player. And all these are qualities which we as professionals need to imbibe. So if we learn them on the sports field, whatever, and I think 
in that sense team sports help more than non team sports you know something like hockey or football or Actually, basketball or volleyball but yeah, sports a big teacher yeah yes absolutely so my last question to you ma'am is that you know what makes you happy what makes me happy <laughs> well talking to you is making me happy <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much uh, but you know it's been a pleasure speaking to you great great conversation so many things that you know i learned during the conversation and um, you know i look forward to you know doing it uh, once again because i think there are you know so many things that are uh, um, to be discussed which we could not encapsulate in such a short period of time so thank you so much ma'am so let me just answer it with one more line of what makes me happy in yes. this talking to you uh, so what makes me happy i thought that was the ultimate happiness i thought that was the ultimate happiness so i so <laughs> please go ahead so getting justice for people getting fair you know a fair deal for somebody who has been wronged gives me a happiness spending time with my family gives me a lot of happiness um which is and get it, spending time with my friends so just being with people that you love that you uh know that life is short and so if you get that snatches of time with those you care about it's very important traveling makes me very happy going for my evening walk and i can't can't i shouldn't end without that makes me absolutely. very happy absolutely and i am a guilty of you know keeping you away <laughs> from your evening walk in one of the evenings <laughs> so yeah. all this makes me happy um i think spending more time on some extra curricular sporty activity would make me even happier but the hills make me happy beaches make me happy so there is a lot i think there has to be a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment uh both personally and professionally and i think that's really what is satisfying super thank you so much ma'am this was amazing and it was a great conversation 